It's the final countdown for the Memphis Grizzlies as they enter their final hoop night of the preseason. They are taking on the Detroit Pistons tonight in Detroit. Going to be a massive game. Not really. It's a preseason game. But you understand. It's another opportunity to see what these young Grizzlies are up to. We're going to talk about that and more on this episode of Locked on Grizzlies. Join me and locking in, won't you? You are Locked on Grizzlies. Your daily Memphis Grizzlies podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello. Hi there. My name is Joe Molinax. I am one of the wonderful co-hosts of this wonderful podcast that you can catch each and every day as part of the Locked On Network. Again, thank you so much for making Locked On Grizzlies your first listen every day. Catch us wherever you have your podcast, your favorite podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple, iHeart, literally every single one. You can find the Locked On Podcast Network, which means you can find Locked On Grizzlies. And that also means that you can find us and subscribe and rate and review and give us all of those wonderful thumbs up, uh, all those great comments. And you can also find us on YouTube if you prefer to see my ugly mug flying solo. DeMichael Cole is much better looking than me. We can all agree on that, at least. So if you want to see him when he's on the show, maybe YouTube's your bet. If you want to just help us out, you know, make me feel better about myself and watch on YouTube, it would be appreciated there as well. But subscribe, rate, review. Make sure you're following along as the NBA season gets underway. I'm flying solo on this episode to Michael getting a well-deserved evening off between games. You will see DeMichael flying solo on the Friday episode of Locked on Grizzlies, and then we'll take you into next week as a unified front getting ready for the first regular season game. But before we get to that, before we get to the first regular season game, it's another hoop night in terms of the Grizzlies preseason slate. They are closing out said preseason slate with a game against the Detroit Pistons in Detroit at one of my favorite NBA arenas, Little Caesars Arena. Not because I've ever been there before, but because it is named after pizza. And how can you be mad at a building that is named after a delicious slice? I certainly cannot be. Not saying that Little Caesars is the best pizza in the world. We're not going to get too deep into those woods. But it's pizza, right? Being named after food, not too shabby. Something that is pretty shabby so far this season, or this preseason, I should say, is the record of the Detroit Pistons in said preseason. They are 0-3. They have yet to win a game. Your Memphis Grizzlies are 2-2. and That means that they are inherently better than the Detroit Pistons, right? This should be a cakewalk. No, I say to you, I don't think it will be that. I think that depending on how Taylor Jenkins treats the game, a lot can be decided. I think you'll see him playing the, the the starters in terms of dress rehearsal kind of stuff, seeing how they do, and then maybe once he decides he's seen enough, he'll start pulling back the reins. But let's talk about these young Pistons first, and not to go too far into their roster, because again, it's a preseason game. You're not breaking down the opponent in a preseason game, at least not that intensely. You're still very much at this stage if you're Taylor Jenkins, the head coach of the Memphis Grizzlies, worried about what your team's going to do, how you are going to respond, how you are going to execute compared to what you did in Orlando against the Magic when perhaps you didn't have as much success as you would have wanted to, especially early on in that game. So you want to see how your team starts faster against the Detroit Pistons. And that won't be a guarantee because the Grizzlies started slowly against the Magic. I think it was 31-17 to 17 at the end of the first quarter in favor of Orlando. Detroit, although they lose eventually the game to the Oklahoma City Thunder most recently, it was a 115-99 to 99 outcome. Detroit won the first quarter against the Thunder, and they were up at the half by three. So the wheels come off in the second half. They're almost the inverse of the Grizzlies. Memphis picked it up as the game went on, whereas the Pistons started slowly, or excuse me, started well, and then fizzled out late. So it's two teams going in different directions in terms of how they're actually competing in these games. Uh, The Pistons are extremely young. They are a team in flux. 
They drafted the very fun Jaden Ivey uh, in terms of his physical ability to get to the basket, all the great things that he did while he was at Purdue. A lot of folks thought that maybe he'd be an interesting fit alongside John Morant in Memphis and Desmond Bain and that crew, but obviously it didn't work out that way. And Ivy is a member of the Pistons. And the starting five of the Pistons is going to look different because Marvin Bagley III suffered a knee injury. Thankfully, it's not that serious, uh, but Bagley will be out for this game and for the next few weeks, it sounds like at least, as he recovers from that injury. So that might mean that you see an old friend of Memphis, Jalen Duren, the former Memphis Tiger, in the starting lineup, possibly for the Pistons. They could go in a variety of different ways. They could go small and bring in, you know, a Corey Joseph or a Killian Hayes. They could decide to go big, like I mentioned with Duren. There's lots of different things they could do. But again, we're not game planning for a preseason. We're just familiarizing ourselves with what, especially that starting lineup is going to look like. And I think that the starting lineup, even with Bagley out, is underrated in terms of what it could potentially do. And you got to remember, Bogdanovich, right? Bo, Boan, Bo, uh, Bilhan, a Bogon, goodness gracious. Boan Bogdanovich is out. Returning to competition reconditioning was the official listing. I'm not sure if he'll play in this game or not, but he certainly will be a part of the Pistons rotation. And again, if he's a starter, he could be that guy that replaces Bagley in the starting five once the season gets officially underway next week. But anyway, Sadiq Bey, not a bad basketball player. Isaiah Stewart. They call him Beef Stew, I believe. Again, a, a guy that can bang on the glass a little bit, can get physical with Steven Adams. Cade Cunningham, former top pick in the NBA draft, very talented player. And I just mentioned Ivy, who likely will be another starter for this team. So they're young. They're inexperienced. If Bogdanovich plays, that obviously adds to their experience. But that's one guy among the, the five that has a lot of playing time and experience at the NBA level. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to fizzle out as they did before. There's going to be things that they don't fully execute on, like uh, both Cunningham and Ivy. They both had four turnovers in that game against the Thunder. So eight total turnovers compared to six assists. That's not a good ratio. That's not something that you're looking for. So the Pistons are certainly going to be viewed upon as an underdog in this game if you're looking at that in the preseason. And if you are, you know, you might need to, call the the gambling help hotline but the main thing for Detroit in terms of what the Grizzlies should be looking at is how to attack the size of Stewart how to get them in mismatch opportunities on the offensive end giving Morant downhill lanes giving the uh, players like Bain a chance to get clean looks at the basket not just from three not just from the mid-range but at the rim you know DeMichael and I have talked about on these podcast waves, the need for Bain to keep being that guy that can show that he can get to the basket. That was one of the most positive things, at least in my opinion, coming out of that loss against the Magic. And we talked about it on a, a recent episode. The fact he had eight free throw attempts, you know, that doesn't sound like a ton. John Moran had 10 and Bain made the same amount of shots from free throw line as Ja. Bain was seven for eight and Ja was seven for 10. So he's being more physical in terms of taking off people off the dribble, attacking the lane, getting to the free throw line and getting points that way because he's a very good free throw shooter, which makes sense because he's a very good three point shooter. You want to see continued growth in terms of acknowledging mismatches or inexperience and taking advantage of it. Because even though the Grizzlies are young, they have more experience than the Pistons do. And you obviously are interested in what kind of rotation work is going on, how they're going to actually fit all these pieces together in this last game. I'm going to tell you how I would do that, how I personally would go about building the rotation for this final preseason game, trying to figure out exactly who's going to be actually in that mix going into the game against the Knicks next week, opening night on October 19th. I think this should be a dress rehearsal game. I think Taylor Jenkins sees it that way as well. But what that rehearsal would actually entail. That is something that we'll talk about next on Locked on Grizzlies. But first, I don't know if you know this or not, but betonline.net is your number one source, not just for NBA betting or basketball. It's for football, MLB as the playoffs start. 
tons of sports in terms of betting information all season long. BetOnline.net is your best bet. Find all of the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every game that you can find. If you're interested in the line for Grizzlies Knicks, I believe it's uh, the Grizzlies are favored by six and a half points. You can check out if that line has changed or if that is accurate at betonline.net. As always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all your sport wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite games and events, including the Major League Baseball playoffs, MMA, boxing, golf, it's betonline.net. Head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. I think it's important to understand that in a preseason game, there's only so much information that can be gained, right? And you have to decide when the juice is worth the squeeze. At what point do you pull John Morant from a Detroit Pistons preseason game? How many minutes do you actually plan on him playing? The team doesn't play again for six days, right? They don't play again until opening night on Wednesday. So you have to balance that reality. And even though the team played two nights ago, as we mentioned on a recent episode of Locked On Grizzlies, that's very much the norm, right? Playing one game, then having a day off, then playing another game. So I think you'll see the Grizzlies in a somewhat normal rotation because of that. How long it lasts, that's kind of up to the whims of the preseason. But let's take a look at who actually played in the game against the Magic, and let's see if we can kind of even out or figure out how this should go uh, against the Pistons if it's a true opening night game, or uh, dress rehearsal, I should say. Zaire Williams, as DeMichael Cole said on this show yesterday, is dealing with some back tightness, some soreness. It's possible Zaire doesn't play, not because it's a long-term injury, but because, again, it's a regular, or excuse me, a preseason finale in Detroit against the Pistons, and you have six days off. Probably doesn't make sense to push it at this stage. So it's very likely that Zaire Williams doesn't play. But again, this is my ideal rotation, and ideally, Zaire Williams is healthy, and ideally, Zaire Williams is playing. I'm not going to include Jaron Jackson Jr. in this exercise because he's fully injured whereas Zaire is more of a banged up kind of situation. So, or at least that's what we've been told up to this point. So Zaire Williams would not just play. I think he would start for me. I think he would start. And I think that I would have Dylan Brooks be my four. That's not necessarily because I want to do it on opening night, mind you. It is because I want to get more looks at what that actually looks like. So you'd have John Morant at the one, Desmond Bain at the two, Zaire at the three, Brooks at the four, and then Steven Adams at the five. It very well could still be Santi Aldama being in that starting spot. Or maybe Jenkins decides that John Conchar has done something to earn it, and he should be that guy. Uh, Santi Aldama probably will be the starter, but again, I'm trying to get reps. I'm trying to get looks on film, and I want to see what Dylan Brooks is the starting four looks like. Six foot seven, good frame, obviously not an ideal fit in that spot. And defensively, there would certainly be concerns. Against a team like Detroit, if they go Duran, or during it in their uh, in, as their second big, and you've got Beef Stew, Isaiah Stewart, and Jalen there. Maybe Dylan doesn't make as much sense as that guy, and you go with someone like a Brandon Clark or even a Santi Aldama and see how he does in that fit. But I would go Dylan because again, the mismatch works both ways, right? One of those two bigs is going to be tasked with having to defend Dylan Brooks, who is capable off the dribble of creating his own shot who is capable of getting open from range. Obviously, opposing teams maybe want him to shoot threes at this point. But the from the rim to the three-point land to the mid-range, Brooks probably is the third best on the team behind Morant, obviously, and Bain at creating his own look and being able to score the basketball in that way. And I like his odds against any big for the Detroit Pistons and most bigs in the NBA for that matter. So I would like to see Dylan as the starter. Again, for getting reps, for getting things on tape. Rotation-wise, that would mean that you're continuing to get reps for a John Conchar. I think my leading minute getter, and you're going to think I'm crazy for this. You're going to think I'm weird, but just hear me out. I'm playing David Roddy, I think, 25 minutes in a game against the Detroit Pistons, and here's why. Because David Roddy is a guy who I think gives you your best chance at creating 
that positionless basketball that we talk about so much that, you know, Parker Fleming, the site manager over at Grizzly Bear Blues now, my protege, uh, when I was back running that blog for SB Nation, he was my number two for several years. And Parker would always talk about positionless basketball. When I look at David Roddy and his 6'5", 6'6", frame, he gives off strong Draymond Green vibes. Not in terms of being as good as Draymond Green. I don't need Warriors fans in the comments saying how stupid I am because I think David Roddy is as good as Draymond Green. I know how intense Warriors fans can be. I'm talking about the versatility. I'm talking about how I see David Roddy as a player that can do a variety of things. And again, you don't know fully what someone can do until they get an opportunity to actually physically play. So you look at the situation of Roddy playing some two, playing some three, maybe even playing some four, given his build and his strength and what he's able to physically do, not just with the basketball in his hand, but with it out of his hand. He's a solid screener. He's ready for that physicality as a former football player. He is fully engaged with the idea of team rebounding and being an aggressive grass or glass crasher, even if he's at the two as a guard. He is a true one through four, especially two through four, but maybe even one through four player. And I am not saying that this would make him a permanent fixture in a regular season rotation. I'm just saying I want to see more of Roddy. And I'm not ready to just say, ah, he's an 11th or 12th man. He can just hang out and play in South Haven a little bit. I want to see if he can be that 10th guy because I haven't seen enough from Jake LaRavia. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen enough from Jake LaRavia to say that's the guy. I haven't seen enough from Xavier Tillman in terms of the versatility that our own DeMichael Cole wrote about in the commercial appeal saying X knows that he has to build his skill set. He needs to show that he can be a four and not just a five. But in order to do that, especially in the Grizzlies offense, you have to have some semblance of a handle. You have to be able to facilitate offense on a consistent basis. It just can't be one time that you do it. And X hasn't shown that capacity. Again, it's just preseason. Facing live game reps and live game action, that's the best way to get those vibes. But we've seen X play a lot of basketball. David Roddy, not so much. I want to see more of David Roddy in my rotation. So he would lead in terms of minutes played. But beyond that, I think that I would go with the standard fare. You know what I mean? I would go Tyus Jones, 16 to 18 minutes. Brandon Clark, about 18 minutes. I think that you keep letting Moravia play, play and find his footing. And that puts you in a spot where, you know, obviously Santi's not starting in that role. So he'd be in the mix for another 16 to 18 minutes. And you're looking at playing the starters 32-ish per starting spot. Not necessarily Steven Adams, and that's where Santi could get a little bit more run. You got more big ish players in that uh, reserve role if you start Zaire in my ideal rotation. But that would be how it would work. I'd go Morant, Bain, Williams, Brooks, Adams. I'd want to see David Roddy as the sixth man, and then Jones, Conchar, Clark, and Aldama getting run. I want to see reps. I want to see what these guys do when given the opportunity within the schemes that they're being taught and the techniques, I want them to continue to be challenged. And in the preseason, that's where you have the best opportunity to do that. Obviously they'll have some practice days coming up this long layoff between the end of the preseason and the start of the regular season. There's gifts and curses to that. There's positives and negatives guys like Zaire Williams, again, not known as of this recording, whether or not he plays against Detroit he sounds banged up. You got to get that guy healthy. He's important to what they're trying to do. If he's a healthy scratch, then you start to scratch your head and wonder what the heck happened with this Grizzlies team because obviously they saw Zaire as an important piece. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done the things that they did moving on from DeAnthony Melton and Kyle Anderson. I want reps. I want live tape. I want to be able to evaluate these rookies and say, LaRavia can help us. Roddy can help us. You can't necessarily make that grandiose type of statement off of a preseason game, but it's added rep and, uh, added ammunition. It is added opportunity and added minutes on the floor where you have a larger sample size to pull from as you establish what your actual rotation is going to look like. You're going to play 10 guys, roughly. I don't see Taylor Jenkins going beyond that with this current crop of Grizzlies. I don't know that he needs to. Who is that 10th man? 
That sounds like a low key, you know, fortunate son problem, but the Grizzlies got to figure that out because that 10th man, as the season grinds along, might become the ninth man and the eighth man. And there's a lot of things that have to be considered in terms of how that reserve piece is going to fit. When we come back on Locked on Grizzlies, we're going to close the show talking about a reserve piece that will not be fitting in Memphis, at least not as of now. Thank goodness, I believe, I might add. I'm happy about this development. Maybe you're not, uh, depending on how you view uh, the, the wonderful work of Jay Crowder. But I'm going to talk about how some, some uh, rumors were squashed uh, in terms of the Grizzlies being involved in that mix. So we'll see how that goes. Excited to talk about it with you next here on Locked on Grizzlies. Last but not least, I'm sad to say, it sounds like there's not going to be a Jay Crowder Memphis reunion as of now. Uh, per Jake Fisher of Yahoo Sports, he says that Memphis is not currently or actively, to directly quote him, pursuing Crowder in their own right. The Suns aren't interested in Danny Green as a potential return. The fit doesn't make sense because obviously beyond that Danny Green expiring contract, Memphis would be parting with something of value beyond probably what Jay Crowder is in exchange for Jay Crowder services. I saw this report and I was thrilled. And I know what you're thinking. You were thrilled because you're a Jay Crowder hater, Joe. I've been following your work through GBB. I listen to your terrible takes on Twitter. I read your terrible takes. You just don't like Jay Crowder. You don't understand that he's got the dog in him, Joe. You don't understand that he is the boss man that brought so much of the Grizzlies. Just stop it. He shot 29.3% from three. He took shots away from Jaron Jackson Jr. in particular. He is a good NBA player that was not good in Memphis, and I don't see the fit. I don't think anything has changed to make that fit better. That's my personal opinion, and it sounds like the Memphis Grizzlies agree with me at least to the point that they're not willing to make a move that would put themselves in jeopardy of losing something that they have long-term value in. That doesn't necessarily mean that the Grizzlies aren't interested in dealing and wheeling and trying to improve this roster. I do think it means that they want to see what Santi Aldama can do. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with them not making some grandiose leap to try to bring in a veteran like a Jay Crowder uh, for peanuts, essentially. No offense to Danny Green, but he can't play. Danny Green is a contract, essentially, until he is physically capable of playing, and that won't be until the spring, if then. So, of course, the Phoenix Suns don't want Danny Green. They need someone that can physically help them because the Suns are title contenders, just like the Grizzlies are. And if Jay Crowder is this great player, why in the world would the Phoenix Suns send Jay Crowder to the Memphis Grizzlies, who in theory are completely competing with them for that number one spot in the Western Conference, be it the top seed or be it the honor of coming out of the West and playing in the NBA Finals. It never really carried with me. I, I didn't see the logic there. But I certainly don't see the logic from a Grizzlies perspective because of their inactivity in the past when it comes to trades not necessarily trades in general, because obviously the Grizzlies, when they want to get a draft pick, for example, they're willing to, to make some calls and some exchanges. But they are picking their spot very, very carefully when it comes to what they are going to do when the time comes to cash in some of their chips and, excuse me, and bring in a veteran presence. Jay Crowder ain't that guy. They are going to wait and see what happens very much like the Toronto Raptors did with Kawhi Leonard. And they are going to pick and choose their spot if they do it at all. And that is going to be how they do it. It's not going to be for someone like Jay Crowder. And I say if they do it at all, because I'm starting to doubt whether they will. I think they believe in themselves so much from a draft perspective that they see the culture that is being built. They understand that they have their stars especially in John Morant, one of the top 10 players in the National Basketball Association. Desmond Bain is a dark horse pick of mine to make the all-star team as a reserve. Jaron Jackson Jr., 
defensive, uh, all first team, all defense, defensive player of the year candidate, potentially, depending on when he comes back in terms of his health. They've got the stars. Does a fourth man really make sense at this point? Or do they just keep supplementing and building around those three stars, bringing in team friendly rookie contracts and be able to keep players of substance like Morant, Bain and Jackson Jr. together on the larger contracts that they're going to be dealt and deservingly so dealt and allow for the pieces around them to rotate. I think that that's what they're content with. I believe the idea that they kick the tires on Kevin Durant, because why wouldn't you kick the tires on Kevin Durant? It's freaking Kevin Durant. He's one of the best scorers in the history of the National Basketball Association. But the cost was probably too high. Desmond Bain is arguably the most valuable player in the NBA, not because he's the best, but because of his contract. you got to remember, he was the 30th pick in the 2020 NBA draft. That means he makes the lowest amount possible on a four-year rookie-scale deal with the two team options at the end. Obviously, the Grizzlies are going to opt in to the fourth year of that deal. They have to sign him to an extension probably next summer. But Desmond Bain is not making very much money this year, folks, and he might be an all-star. That is on the table for Desmond Bain. Trading him away for Kevin Durant, that's a risky move. That's a risky move. I think it's fair to have the conversation as to whether or not you would have done it. But there's no denying that there's risk inherited there because of the investment that you made to bring him in and be a positive contributor to that culture that you're trying to build. So if you're not going to make the swing at Kevin Durant, you're probably not going to give much of substance to the Phoenix Suns for Jay Crowder, who the Grizzlies, obviously, including John Morant, arguably the most important figure in this puzzle. I'm sure they'd be thrilled to have Jay Crowder back. He was beloved by the players. And he was really liked by a lot of the fans. It just doesn't make sense for either team at this stage. Phoenix wants to stay strong and get better out of the trade. They want to bring in a player that can at least contribute in the here and now. The Memphis Grizzlies don't have a solid role for Jay Crowder. Jay Crowder is probably not a three full time at this point. That's putting him into a a crowded front court with Aldama and Adams and Clark and Xavier Tillman, Jaron Jackson Jr. when he returns. And a part of the frustration is Jay Crowder wanting to start. Are you starting Jay Crowder at the three and moving Dylan to the four? Are you cool with Jay Crowder being your starting four and then dealing with the frustration that he may or may not have when Jaron Jackson Jr. returns? There's a lot of baggage there. So Jake Fisher, kudos to you, sir, sir, doing the work of the good and the proud and squashing a bit the idea of Jay Crowder coming back to Memphis. I personally, I'm not going to lie, I don't see the value in it for the Grizzlies from a player perspective. Non-biased addition, you're already in with the development uh, philosophy. And it's worked for you to this point, in fairness. They have earned a heat check. They continue to not operate like a contender because they don't have to. The work that they've done to this point has put them in contendership. Why rush that? Why risk some of that capital that you've earned in terms of establishing a culture on a veteran guy who is probably not a wing anymore, who isn't going to help you win a championship? Almost certainly. Recent results excluded. The Grizzlies are still very young. Jay Crowder was a veteran presence on veteran teams in Miami and in Phoenix, or at least alongside more veteran presences. I know Phoenix has several young players, too. There's just more of a fit for him elsewhere in the NBA. And again, the the opportunity cost to both Memphis and Phoenix just don't round out. So that Jake Fisher report probably means that Memphis is going to head into the New York Knicks opening night game with the guys that are currently on the roster. And I'm okay with that. They've earned the heat check. Let's see what Santi Aldama can do. Let's see what John Conchar can do as a reserve. It may not work great. It may not. But I've said all along, even though I would have made a larger move as if I was the GM, and most folks say, thank goodness I'm not, if I was the GM, I would have made a bigger deal. I would have tried harder at least. And again, we don't know how hard Zach Kleiman actually tried. I would have gotten something done. I would have overpaid 
to do it. And maybe that's wrong. They're playing the long game. They've earned the opportunity to play the long game. Even though I disagreed with it, I, as a follower of this team, am willing to watch it play out and see how it goes for the franchise. Thanks again for making Locked On Grizzlies your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, go check out the Ultimate Pro Basketball Preview 2022. It's a six-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NBA season. The local team experts and the NBA insiders of the Locked On Podcast Network and Odyssey, all combining into one Ultimate NBA Preview. Search for Ultimate Pro NBA Preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. On our next show, again, DeMichael's going to fly solo. I have a sneaky suspicion he'll talk about all the craziness that is sure to ensue when the Grizzlies take on the Pistons tonight. Hoop night for the Memphis Grizzlies taking on the Detroit Pistons. Check out DeMichael flying solo on the Friday episode of this very podcast talking about storylines going into the long layoff for the Grizzlies before they take on the New York Knicks on opening night. Thank you so much for making us your first listen each and every day. It is much appreciated. I appreciate you continuing to roll with Locked On Grizzlies and making us a part of your Memphis Grizzlies experience. So again, I'm Joe Molinax. Thank you for listening, watching, however you're taking us in. Rate, review, subscribe, and continue to lock in with us here on Locked On Grizzlies.